introduction. I'm Bruce Klingner. I'm the Senior Research Fellow for Northeast Asia here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, Japan's New Leader Faces China Threat and Other Challenges. So the unexpected resignation of Prime Minister Abe has raised concerns over the future course of Japan's diplomatic, uh, security, and economic policies. And as Japan's longest serving uh, prime minister, he brought stability as well as in, uh, enacting an impressive list of national security and diplomatic initiatives. So how will the selection of Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga impact Japan's security and other policies? So given the, the range and depth of the challenges that Mr. Suga faces, uh, one wonders whether we should really be offering our condolences rather than congratulations on being selected as the leader who has to face those challenges. So we have a great panel or Japanel this morning, uh, and I'm delighted to invite our speakers to join me on screen as I tell you a little bit about them. So if they could turn on their monitors, thank you. Uh, Tobias Harris is the senior vice president uh, at Teneo, a political consulting firm. Uh, and really, I think has been the man of the hour uh, recently. He's the author of the Iconoclast, uh, Shinzo Abe and the New Japan. Uh, and I suspect that he single-handedly brought about the resignation of Prime Minister Abe just to boost uh, his uh, sales of his book. Jeffrey Horning is a political scientist at uh, RAND. And I found really to be the go-to expert on Japanese security and foreign policies, particularly on the the U.S.-Japan alliance, but also more broadly on uh, U.S. security and foreign policies uh, throughout the region. And Maria Solis uh, from Brookings, which many people are surprised to know is my first job uh, out of college. I was at Brookings for a year and a half. Uh, she is the senior fellow uh, in foreign policy and director at the Center for East Asian Policies uh, and also the Philip Knight Chair in Japan Studies and really a, a stupendous expert in Japan's economy as well as a range of other issues. So. Uh, the way we're going to work today is uh, each of the panelists will be pre uh, doing a short presentation, and then we're going to go to Q&A uh, from the audience. So please feel for, uh, free to send in picture or questions. So right now, I'm going to ask uh, Tobias to present uh, his views on how uh, Mr. Suga's selection will impact Japan's sort of diplomatic and political realm. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, it's really a pleasure, particularly to be here on a panel with um, with friends. Um, Jeffrey and, and Maria, it's great to see you this morning. Uh, too bad we can't be in the same place. Um, so the Suga government is now a few hours old. Um, in fact, as we speak, Suga is giving his first uh, press conference as prime minister. So this is all new and fresh. And, and I think there's a lot of uh, anxiety, you know, transitioning from the longest um, government that Japan has ever seen, uh, a, a uniquely stable government, particularly in a very unstable moment, especially over the last few years for Japan. And, I mean, so naturally, I think there's a lot of trepidation. Uh, Suga, despite having been uh, in the public eye, giving press conferences twice a day for nearly eight years, is still something of an unknown figure. And so I think uh, that alone has, has, I think, created a lot of anxiety that people are trying to fill. And so what I, what I want to do uh, in my time before yielding to um, Jeffrey and Murray on some of the uh, the policy challenges he faces. I just want to uh, discuss this question of whether we're going to see a return to a revolving door premiership, you know, that you had six prime ministers in six years before Abe came back. And, you know, I think you can make a case uh, on both sides. I mean, there, there's there's arguments to be had for uh, reasons why Suka is going to survive, but also why uh, we might see him exit sooner than, than everyone might hope, uh, both within Japan and, and elsewhere. I mean, I, I think the first, I'll, I'll be, I'll, it's morning. I've had my coffee. I'm feeling good. Well, we'll start with the positive reasons why why I think he might uh, have a chance to survive beyond next year, for example, when uh, he'll have to face another LDP leadership election because he's serving out the remainder of Abe's term. First of all, I, I think we have to consider uh, maybe some of the intangibles and, and some of the personality uh, factors. And on the one hand, Sugo, you know, is is you know he's wielded power sort of behind the throne. Um, not you know he's been in the public eye, but not in uh, a personal capacity, sort of uh, as this uh, organizer of the Abe government and doing a lot of the work behind the scenes. So the public hasn't really had a chance to know him. But we've seen over the last couple of weeks uh, the sort of soft focus um, profiles of him. And what stands out is, I mean, I think more than anything else, is that unlike a number of his predecessors, and certainly within the LDP, he is not a hereditary politician. Uh, as every profile notes, he's the son of a strawberry farmer from Akita Prefecture, so way up north, uh, came to Tokyo when he was when he was a teenager, 
uh, found his way into politics, worked his way up you know, from a lowly secretary to a local politician to a national politician. So he has a, um, you know, I, I think a sense of what the public wants, of, of how to satisfy voters, of how to communicate with voters. Uh, and you know, a number of profiles have noted that he um, you know, was sort of tireless on the, you know, as a campaigner and you know, being out talking to voters. I, you can't dismiss the importance of that. And you know, for eight years, you know, he was the one standing and you know, whispering in op-ed's ear, you know, don't forget the economy, don't forget what the voters want. You know, he is Mr. It's the economy, stupid, you know, during the Abe years. Um, you know, one incident back in 2013 when Abe, you know, remembers Abe going to Yasukuni. Before that, uh, you know, Abe was, you know, Suga was there telling him, you can go at any time, you know, don't lose sight of the importance of the economy. Don't lose sight on what you were elected to do. And so and he brings the sensibility of you know, knowing what voters want, knowing how to appeal to voters. And, and we shouldn't underestimate the importance of that. Um, you know, I, I think he's going to enter office with a honeymoon period. And I think there's a chance of preserving that if he stays focused on you know, really the number one challenge, which is you know, getting, getting Japan through the pandemic, getting the economy back on its feet. And if you listen to what he's already said in the press conference he gave today, I was just checking in before we started. I mean, that is the message he's delivering, that, that is his, his, he's laser focused on that. The other thing, he was chief cabinet secretary far longer than anyone else. And he, you know, this was not someone who was just, you know, Abe told him what to do and he went to do it. He was part of the, the key decision-making apparatus of the Abe government from the beginning. You know, he knows how, how the central apparatus of government works. He was a master of personnel appointments. He basically, um, from day one, was saying, I'm going to tell, I'm going to decide who, which bureaucrats are getting promoted. And then he was given that formal authority and was able to use it. And I think the bureaucracy now... Um, you know, will answer to him. He will have. Uh, he know, certainly knows how to make the bureaucracy work and how to get his will implemented in the government. And you can't. I mean, you, how do you put a price on that? In the past, it's something that really uh, undermined past governments and was something that that they struggled with. I don't think he's going to have a problem with that. I think maybe a third factor. Um, maybe this complements the. the uh, his laser focus on, on the issues the voters care about most. And that is, I don't think we can underestimate the extent to which the public wants stability to continue. And you look at the polls that have been conducted since Abe announced his resignation, they want a leader to stay. They're not looking for a caretaker. They're not looking for someone to stay. And I think they're going to give, I, I think it means they're going to give Suga a chance. And, you know, even, you know, that gives them some room for error. I mean, you look at Abe's last few years, I mean, Abe from 2017 onwards was basically dealing with, with, uh, allegations of, of scandal and corruption for for several years, and it really was only until the pandemic and and really towards the very end that his numbers fell and stayed down. I mean, he was able he basically endured a lot of punishment without really the public abandoning him. And I think if Suga is you know he's fo if he's focused on the economy, is saying the right things. Uh, I mean, there's a good chance that he's going to keep the public with him, that because they want stability and because there's not really an opposition um, that has shown any ability to draw votes away from the government and, and to get the independent voters out if there's an election. I mean, that that really gives him some room for comfort um, and to find his footing and to really establish himself. Uh, now, on the flip side, um, you know, some reasons why I think there's anxiety and, and not without justification. There is this fact that he is he's still sort of an unknown Factor. He is this kind of older, uh, grayer figure, not you know, not exactly known for being exuberant. I mean, there's been joking about how we're now finally seeing pictures of him smiling after you know years of seeing him as the dour figure in, in press conferences. I mean, so there's a chance that he's just not going to resonate with voters. Um, you know, that that the electorate is going to be put off for various reasons. You know, he's he has a way with the press that. Um, can be a little curt, which maybe the voters don't really care about that. But after a certain point, if he looks um, unkind, you know, there, it, we just don't, again, we just don't know. And it, it's easy to see ways in which the public just does not react well to him, does not um, respond. And then when things start to turn, you know, if he runs into trouble, that the public abandons him pretty quickly. Connected to that, I mean, the LDP, we, we, don't, we don't quite know what the LDP is going to look like. I mean, Abe, I think was very lucky, Come, came back in 2012, the LDP had been in opposition, uh, did not want to go back into opposition, um, you know, behaved itself essentially. It was a much more unified party. You had a lot of LDP members who were elected in 2012 and owed their elections to Abe. Um, you know, he wrote in, they wrote in on his coattails. The, the question is whether Suga is going to have that same sort of control um, of the party apparatus, if he's going to be able to keep discipline. Um, on the one hand, his election depended on uh, most of the party's faction bosses lining up behind him. Um, and if that unity holds, then maybe he'll be fine. And he also has... Uh, uh, Nikai Toshihiro, the LDP Secretary General, he and Suga uh, had a really effective working relationship over the last few years of the Abe government. 
uh, Nikai basically guaranteed um, Suga's election when he when he quickly threw his his weight um, behind Suga, and then the rest of the factions lined up behind him. Nikai has been a very effective controller uh, of the party. He's sort of known um, when the party's voice needs to be heard more, when policy is being making being made, and then when it needs to be more quiet. Um, and so you do have that partnership. It is a relationship that's going to matter. And and I think sometimes we, we in recent days, just seeing some discussion about the factions, they have not really played a role in policy. And I, and I don't think we should expect that all of a sudden backbenchers are going to be uh, undermining the Conte, uh, you know, the prime minister's office on policy again. I don't think there's, the pendulum is going to swing that far back, particularly when you have someone like Suga who knows how to make the Conte work uh, and how to make it control the policymaking process. And my last point, and this will hopefully set the table for, for Jeffrey and, and Maria on some of the policy challenges. The fact is he, he's got a lot on his plate to come. I mean, the pandemic is still ongoing. He's going to have to make sure that you don't see another spike in cases and, and keep that under control. The economy, we just saw Japan had its worst quarter of GDP growth ever. Um, you know, things are still kind of slowly coming back. There's still a lot to a lot to do. And he's already hinted that there might need to be another supplemental budget. And then on the foreign policy front, I mean, you know, there are questions about the relationship with the United States, particularly as you enter into negotiations for host nation support. The relationship with China is completely up in the air, certainly compared to where things were at the start of the year. Um, it, I mean, there's a lot to do and there's a lot a lot that could go wrong and it wouldn't take a lot um, for his government to be upended by some crisis. Basically, it's something that's entirely out of his control. Um, and, and frankly, there are questions too about the cabinet lineup that he unveiled today is older, a lot of inexperienced people in jobs where where you might need it, including in the defense ministry. So, you know, Jeff, maybe Jeffrey will get into that question in particular. But I but I think there are some questions uh, about the fitness of of his cabinet to handle the issues they'll face. So I'm going to stop there and uh, hand over to my other panelists. Right, that, that's great. You were able to cover a, a a lot of territory, and then we'll cover some more uh, during the Q and A. I think I was having some bandwidth issues. My, my daughter is in college and. Her class started, and that's when I noticed I was having some trouble with bandwidth issues. Uh, anyway, Jeffrey, if uh, I could ask you to give some thoughts on the security side. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Um, thank you for hosting this. This is a very timely and important uh, topic. Um, yeah, Prime Minister Suga. Uh, kind of strange to say that, but uh, Prime Minister Suga. Uh, he's the, the challenges that he faces in the security realm are unchanged from those that Abe faced. The difference is. Uh, I think is that we knew what Abe's vision was for foreign policy and for defense. We really don't know what Suga-san's vis uh, vision is. Uh, I know, as Tobias was saying, he did have a press conference. I was catching little pockets of it here and there. I wasn't able to watch the whole thing through. But the how Suga-san sees Japan's role, what he sees Japan's relationship is with the United States and regional countries is an important thing to watch for because the challenges remain unchanged. And so let me look, just talk a, a, just a couple of buckets of challenges that I think um, he, he still faces. The first, it's strange to say this, but the United States. Um, you know, as an ally, we're under Abe and Trump, uh, we became very close. And the, we have the host nation support negotiations coming up. And when Abe-san was in, in power, given his personal relationship with Trump, should those talks or get challenging, get, you know, become problematic, Abe, Abe was always there in the pocket that could maybe pick up the phone, call Trump and have a, a personal conversation with. We don't have that now. Of course, uh, Suga could call Trump, but the relationship's not there. And so this really then comes down to the negotiating power of the of Gaimisho and of the State Department. We're going to have a lot of it's going to get down to the the alliance managers, and if things get difficult, if President Trump starts throwing slings and arrows at at Suga, it could get dirty, um, similar to what we've seen happen with uh, the United States and South Korea. The other thing is that we have the presidential election coming up, and so this adds another layer of uncertainty because uh, at this point we don't know who is going to be the president moving forward. And that also makes it difficult for Suga-san to create, to start creating that personal relationship because we don't know if, if it will be president Trump, or president Biden. Um, and then they, but, I, but I think if we look at the U S Japan relationship, the biggest challenge I think for Suga-san is going to be limiting surprises. Um, 
the the alliance functions best when there's predictability, not surprises. Uh, we saw what happened earlier this summer with the Aegis Ashore debate and how that sort of came out of nowhere and and caused a lot of questions to be asked about what what is Japan doing. There's also rumors flying now about Japan canceling their Global Hawk program. Um, I think what the alliance needs is predictability and the one. Tobias raised the raised the cabinet issue. He put in a novice as the defense minister, Abe's younger brother Kishi, and um, he. There are plenty of defense policy wonks in the LDP that could have taken on that role. And for me, when I see that he put uh, a, a novice in for the defense ministry or defense minister, that tells me that Suga's not really thinking about prioritizing security issues. Uh, at least until the next election, or at least until he reshuffles the cabinet. The second bucket of issues is China. Um, if, as as many of your your of people watching this know, China has China and Japan have decades long problems here with Senkaku Islands, with just power imbalances and and rivalry. And since the coronavirus epidemic hit, there's been an upswing in Chinese activity in the East China Sea. Um, you know, Japan has been has been at the the blunt end of Chinese uh, activity over the last decade, whether it be military activity in the air, on the sea, whether it be paramilitary activity in the East China Sea around the Senkaku Islands. That has been on the uptick. We see this past summer uh, just a continuous um, presence of of Chinese assets around the Senkaku Island area. That's not going away. And uh, how the Suga administration is going to handle China is something that we still have yet to see. Uh, Abe, Abe found a pretty good equilibrium. He pushed hard. I think China realized he wasn't going anywhere and they had to manage relations and relations were managed. If, if Suga shows weakness or if there's a sense that he may be going soon, we could have a, a situation of, of an uptick in um, of bad relations again. Um, and if you look at U.S. and China together, I think the bigger issue is what does Suga do with the free and open Indo-Pacific concept? This is sort of the package of uh, coalescing and cooperating with like-minded partners, including the United States, informally balancing or pushing back against Chinese influence in the region. And so under FOIP, you had Japan get really close relations with some key European partners like UK and France, India, Australia, and the Quad. Um, key ASEAN partners. There's a lot that that Abe did under the concept of FOIP, and it's unclear if Suga is going to push that forward. I assume he will because it's it's a concept that that a lot of countries in the region have have really clamped onto. Um, but what is he going to do to make it his own? What is the stamp of the Suga administration on the FOIP? And then the last uh, question, the last issue, and then I'll um, I'll pass it over, um, is the the ongoing issue with South Korea. Uh, I know that uh, you know it's it's a difficult topic, but from an American standpoint, as an ally of the United States, uh, South Korea is just as important to the United States as Japan is to the United States, and it's difficult to watch our two allies constantly having issues, bilateral issues. Um, the big question for me is, what is the Suga administration going to do with South Korea? Is it going to let the 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 tensions continue to flare, or is it going to try to do some sort of restart? I, I noticed um, that the the, minister, the defense minister nominee in South Korea said that he still sees the importance of GSOMIA. That to me is an important message. You have already then South Korean officials signaling to Japan that there is an importance of the security relationship with Japan. I think it's it's vital for the Suga administration to take advantage of that and at least do some goodwill gesture. But again, I understand those tensions are real. There's a lot of issues that are not easy to overcome, but um, the, that is something that the Suga administration is going to be faced with. And with that, I'll stop and I'll turn it over. Great, Th thanks very much. Also uh, covering a lot of territory uh, uh, and we've got some questions already from the audience pertaining to, to some of those. Uh, now, if I could ask uh, Maria to talk about the economic side. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce, for this opportunity to speak about the challenges that the incoming Suga administration faces in the area of domestic and foreign economic policy. 
And the first point to make really is that sugar is taking office at a time of profound crisis. There is no way uh, we can sugarcoat this. Uh, COVID-19 has brought the worst post-war economic contraction uh, for Japan. Annualized GDP fell by 28% in the second quarter of this year. And uh, this huge economic setback occurred, um, you know, even though the country has not experienced an out of control outbreak, even though Japan has not had the extensive lockdowns that we have seen in other countries, nevertheless, the economy has taken a very severe uh, hit. And one question is, why is this the case? Um, I think that the pandemic obviously has created a twin shock, a supply and demand shock. It also is complicated because of how many countries it has hit simultaneously. And that means that Japan's exports have been depressed. Uh, it means that tourism, for example, which had been booming in Japan, has uh, completely, almost completely dried up. It also means that uh, supply chains have been disrupted. And uh, when uh, China went into that very severe lockdown at the beginning of the year, we kept hearing stories about some Japanese companies not being able to continue with their activities because quite simply they did not have the inputs. And also we know that with this uncertainty, obviously it's not the time for when um, uh, businesses think about investing and Japanese consumers have actually clutched the purse even uh, tighter. So I think that, you know, as Suga takes on the uh, position of prime minister, in many ways, the, um, the uh, roadmap, is, roadmap is clear, and that is that emergency response measures are necessary. There is no way out. He needs to continue with the loose monetary uh, policy. He needs to continue with robust fiscal spending. Uh, Japan adopted a supplementary budget of almost $298 billion dollars close to 40% of GDP, and I expect that maybe more will be required uh, in the future. And uh, Suga has also given us an idea of what he thinks about uh, structural reform, what sort of measures Japan will be uh, needing in the future. He has talked about consolidating regional banks, which have been in a weak position. He has been uh, talking about bringing greater competition, say, in the telecommunications uh, sector, so that people can enjoy lower um, cell phone uh, bills. And I think the most interesting idea that he has put out there is that he would create an agency to promote digitalization of, of Japan, an area where Japan has been lagging, an area where actually the pandemic has um, created a necessity for uh, telework, and therefore this may already have created some uh, inertia uh, uh, for that to uh, happen. But, you know, Bruce, what I've been discussing are really, you know, um, select policies, and they might be good ideas. But similar to what Jeff was saying about the overarching foreign policy vision, we do not yet have an overarching vision of how would you reform uh, Japan? What is the end goal here? And I think that when Suga formulates that, and I hope he does, because we do need that roadmap, he will have to address what are the shortcomings of Abenomics. And in this way, he'll have to become his own man. He's inheriting the, inheriting the mantle of Abenomics, but we know that Abenomics was fragile, and therefore he'll have to uh, uh, address how will he create more resilient uh, growth. And you know, it's interesting um, and sad, of course, that you know Japan has had a really great difficulty in uh, addressing a uh, rise in increase in the consumption tax and maintaining economic activity. Every time this has been done, the economy has tanked. And last year, uh, Prime Minister Abe said that he would only go ahead, he would only uh, uh, um, not move ahead with the consumption tax if Japan was hit with a Lehman-type shock that ushered the global financial crisis. Some people were nervous that he was going to go ahead last fall with the increase in the consumption tax, even though the economic outlook was very uncertain because of the uh, uh, China-Japan uh, uh, rivalry, the trade war, and so forth. And nevertheless, he went ahead. And of course, the um, irony and the tragedy is that right after he increased the consumption tax, there was a major contraction in the Japanese economy. And then something much worse than the Lehman Shack hit us, and that is the pandemic. So the V-shaped recovery never took place. And we still don't have good answers as to how can Japan repair its fiscal position and encourage consumption and investment. And that remains a huge challenge for the uh, prime minister. Now, let me turn a little bit to uh, economic diplomacy. 
And here I do expect a strong continuity. I think that, um, you know, as everybody has said, Suga himself does not have direct diplomatic experience, but he has been a central actor in uh, Japan's uh, policy making for years now. And uh, therefore, he's very familiar with these initiatives, and these are initiatives that have paid off for Japan. So I expect that Japan will continue with the uh, path it charted for itself in terms of promoting uh, trade liberalization, multilateral uh, trade agreements, the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Initiative, the deal with the European Union. Just a few days ago, they uh, closed the deal with the UK, and now the UK is um, and talks about joining the CPTPP. So all these initiatives will uh, continue. Um, and it's important to note that in many ways, the obstacles for Japan to become a leader of uh, free trade, those battles have already been fought and won. Prime Minister Abe already pushed to the corner the agricultural lobby. They were already be, uh, were able to create a mechanism for coordinated negotiations to avoid this a constant tug of war among Japanese ministries that have prevented Japan from being very proactive. So in that sense, Japan already is ready to keep on with this set of initiatives. I also believe that, you know, uh, he will hug closely the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy uh, because uh, if it is not there, what else uh, could Japan done in the region? I mean, it has been very successful. Um, as uh, Jeffrey was also saying, many other countries are eager to see Japan continue with this. This is a whole of government approach. So uh, Japanese agencies and organizations are already well geared up, and therefore it's easier to continue with something that was already in place. If there is an imprint, uh, a, a suga uh, uh, um, element to this, how will he then take it to another level? That's something that, as Jeffrey was saying, we still need to wait and see. Now, uh, the interesting question is, of course, what will, um, uh, in terms of economic diplomacy, what will Japan do under Suga vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China? And I do expect that the uh, preference will be to continue with what I would describe as an approach of both selective competition and selective collaboration. And we can see these in different tracks of Japan's uh, economic statecraft. For example, in infrastructure finance, it's very true that Japan is China's peer competitor. Japan is the one country that continues to finance substantial chunks of infrastructure around the world, has codified standards for quality infrastructure finance that in many ways draw a contrast between uh, Japan and China in the way in which they supply uh, capital. But it's also true that um, Japan threw an olive branch to China and agreed to some modest cooperation in infrastructure finance in third countries provided China abided by Japan's standard to supply that capital. So again, you see that mix between competition and collaboration. And the same is true in trade policy. You know, one thing that Japan has been doing in CPTPP, in the WTO, is to negotiate rules that really tackle, try to discipline non-market trading practices. So of course, China is a country that practices those, uh, uh, implements those policies. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Japan is also about to wrap up a negotiation for a regional trade agreement that includes China. So you see that combination. What has been new in the uh, pandemic, uh, Bruce, is that you know Japan now is openly, in official circles, articulating the view that there is a concern with over-reliance on China as a production base. Now, Japanese companies have followed the practice of diversification, what they call China plus one strategies, so that they don't put all the eggs in the China market for many years. But you did not have top government officials articulating that concern and putting public subsidies to facilitate that process. And Japan opened, uh, launched a program, a 2.2 billion subsidy fund to bring about restructuring of supply chain. This brings some production back to Japan, but also diversifies into Southeast Asia. Now, the $2.2 billion uh, um, is not a lot of money if you consider the overall stock of Japanese investment in China, which is in the neighborhood of $100 billion. But nevertheless, it sends a signal, and it will be important to watch. More importantly, I think um, it is a popular program. You know, the second batch of applications just took place, and um, more than uh, 1,600 Japanese and the overall value of the projects that they put forward um, 
is more than 10 times the amount of money that remains in the subsidies in the fund. So clearly there is a lot of demand for such kind of uh, program and it's possible that Prime Minister uh, Suga may decide to expand on the program. One other interesting initiative is that Japan is just at the beginning of a conversation with Australia and India about creating a resilient uh, global supply uh, network about trusted uh, suppliers. Now with India, you always, I always uh, pause a little bit. Uh, we don't know how far this will go. I think this has actually more to do with the fact that India dropped out of the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It is about finding an economic agenda with India. But nevertheless, uh, it seems that Japan has many of the right ideas for uh, the moment. Uh, and I would end by saying that, you know, I think that Suo would like continuity when it comes to economic diplomacy. His priority is going to be the domestic economic challenges, but he may not get the continuity that he wishes for. And a lot will depend on, really on what China and the United States do. Uh, you know, if China becomes even more assertive on the Senkaku, then that will be very difficult then for Japan to continue with the selective collaboration angle to this. And on the other hand, Japan wants to straddle the middle and the United States may not give Japan that option if it continues to tighten the export controls and other measures vis-a-vis uh, -vis Chinese technology firms. So um, the world is not going to wait for uh, uh, Prime Minister Suga. So it's going to be, <laughs> he has to run with his feet. That, that's great. Uh, three really great presentations covered uh, a lot of, of ground. Uh, I have a number of questions uh, from the audience and as well as a few of my own. We'll try to get to, to as many as we can. And, and because all the presentations really were very comprehensive, in some cases, uh, these are sort of expansions on certain areas. Uh, the, the first uh, one I'd, I'd direct to uh, Tobias is uh, last week, Defense Minister Kono or former Defense Minister Kono uh, seemed very confident that there'd be a general election next month. Uh, but then Suga seemed to downplay that like, as if we can't do that during a, a COVID until we get that under control. So uh, do you think there will be a, a general election next month or will it be until or wait until next September? Well, uh, for personal reasons, I would rather not have to cover a uh, general election next month. <laughs> so hopefully not. But no, I, mean, I think you know, the message from Suga um, in his press conference today um, in the sort of build up uh, to you know, lead up to the LDP election on Monday. I mean, he definitely downplayed that. And, you know, I, I don't think he wants, I mean, I don't think he's going to want to be forced into calling an election that he's not comfortable with. I think you've got to deal with the fact that his, uh, the LDP's co uh, coalition partner, Komito, has made very clear it doesn't want an election. It wants to focus on the economy. Suga has made clear he wants a focus on the economy. And, you know, and the fact is, is that the threat of being able to call a general election might actually be a lot more useful to him than actually calling one. You know, that you want to keep LDP members in line, you know, as he tries to establish his footing, you know, being able to say, behave yourselves or, or you know, I'm going to call an election and you're and you're going to be on your own. I'm not going to be there helping you. Um, you know, that that is a useful tool for um, for a LDP leader, a prime minister to have. And it's a lot more useful to have it in your pocket um, than to use it in the first few weeks and then, you know, immediately have the exact same challenges and not be able to threat the, the threaten to call an election because you already did that. So I mean I, I'd be I'd be very surprised if he were to go very quickly to an election. Um, you know, there's obviously anxiety about you know just you know where Japan stands in terms of um, you know its outbreak and, and just the health of the economy. So now I, I think he's going to focus on finding his footing. I mean it's certainly possible that um, before you get um, a, another LDP leadership election next year that he might decide to do one just to strengthen his position going into that. You know that if things go well, if by say like the spring. Uh, he's overcome whatever challenges he faced, you know, no real misstep. You know, maybe you get after the budget passes, maybe you get like a, an early spring or, or a mid spring uh, general election to kind of strengthen his position. And then if the Olympics go forward, he can kind of ride that into the LDP election. Um, that's one scenario. But I, I don't think he's going to go right away. I think it's more useful to wait. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, to Jeff, uh, with not only Abe's resignation, but Defense Minister Kono's being moved to another position, um, does that have any ramifications for uh, Mr. Kono's recent decision on Aegis Ashore? Is there any possibility that that decision gets uh, reversed? Uh, and also, does it uh, his being moved on, since he was seen as a bit of a maverick on, on uh, procurement issues, is there more stability now on future procurement issues, uh, F-35 or other uh, issues, 
Uh, and then any ramifications for uh, Japan's strike capabilities, that decision, which seems like uh, has been deferred till the uh, to the end of the year. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, when I so the the Aegis Ashore, the de, the deployment was canceled. The program itself was not canceled, and so those discussions are you know as as you know the the radar they procured a radar for that. Um, what Japan decides to do with uh, its you know, ballistic missile defense capabilities or wrap it into the broader deterrence debate that you mentioned, that is separate from uh, Konosan's uh, being there or not being there. But I think it raises an important point because if, if Suga-san was serious about really moving forward with strike capabilities, um, then I think we, w I would have expected to see somebody who's really deep in defense issues because they're going to have to be up there in the in the diet and be defending that and explaining it to the public. Instead, you put in a novice on defense issues, and so when I see that, I do not expect uh, the Suga administration to be really taking bold steps in the security sphere, especially something as sensitive as strike capabilities. What I would, uh, what, what my gut is telling me is that I, I would expect to see some changes on the margins uh, regarding strike capabilities. We may see some, some sort of fudging about interpretations that we can do this and, and theoretically, legally, we can do that, which they've already said, but maybe move the boundaries a little bit with in terms of cooperation with the United States, but whether Japan purchases full out surface to surface strike capabilities. I just, I can't see that happening. If they do go forward with that and you have Kishi-san as the defense minister, that's gonna be a really difficult debate to watch in the diet because somebody who has no background in this is gonna to have to defend that. It's it's gonna be a real problem for the Suga cabinet. Great, thank you. Um, Maria, uh, to expand on, on sort of your, your focus on Japan-China uh, economic relations, as, as you point out, uh, Abe's tried to diversify away from the China supply uh, chain. And then obviously we've had lots of concerns on the security side with the incursions into Japan's maritime and, and aerial areas. Um, but right now the U.S. Is, is pushing for a very strong coalition really against China, very much a you're with us or against us. How do you think Suga or Japan in general will react to that? Are they so concerned on the security side and so concerned with uh, the need to diversify away from China that they'll get on board with such an initiative or are they gonna try to straddle the fence between the US partner and ally and China as not only a, a competitor, but an economic collaborator? Thank you, Bruce. Um, well, I think that there is deep concern in Japan about um, China's um, technological ambitions and the methods it uses to get there. And one element that I forgot to mention in my uh, short presentation, and this gives an opportunity, is that I also expect to see continuity in what has become really a new and important track in Japan's foreign economic diplomacy, and that is what we refer to as economic security. And um, that, you know, uh, Japan has tightened the way in which it screens for indirect investment. And it did so very much uh, thinking about the U.S. own uh, measures and the way in which the United States also tightened the CFU's uh, procedure. So Japan wanted to be aligned with the United States. Um, Japan also has seen in Huawei and other Chinese uh, technology firms a real uh, cybersecurity threat, and therefore Japan has decided to abstain in using uh, these uh, telecoms from China when it's thinking about its 5G um, offers. So um, I think that you know there is that alignment, and I expect that Mr. Suga will be in the same place. Um, this ties in with domestic politics, and I would be interested to see what Tobias thinks, but. There's been a lot of talk because one of the reasons why Mr. Suga very quickly became uh, the uh, top contender for the position of party leader and now prime minister was that he uh, received the support of Mr. Nikai, who is a heavyweight in the LDP and who is also seen clearly as a China hand or someone that wants to bring stability to the Japan-China relationship. And this has opened a lot of conversations as to whether Mr. Uh, prime Minister Suga would be more inclined to have a, a, 
uh, even further improvement of ties with um, with China. My sense is that you know uh, Mr. Nikai was not a kingmaker. That this was uh, uh, you know he received Mr. Suga received the support of several factions, and I think therefore that this will mean that Mr. Suga will also try to achieve that balancing act. And we'll see, you know, um, for example, big Japanese companies have all said they're not going to leave China. This is a huge market. So what we're talking about is the recalibration of risk. And I think that Japan has also showed us that you can, you know, um, compartmentalize. You can play hardball in some areas, but try to keep uh, the relationship going. So, um, you know, to bring it to how they... Uh, Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Suga's administration um, might see the U.S.-China uh, tech rivalry. I think that there will be alignment with the concerns about uh, China's intentions. Uh, China's moves for self-reliance also undermine the economic interdependence that they've had had with uh, Japan. That's a matter of concern. But I still believe that there's concern about the United States overplaying its hand. There's no support in Japan for unilateral tariffs for overextensive export controls that may get Japanese companies uh, in trouble. And they also would like to see consistency and competency in the execution of policy. So, you know, all these uh, comments from President Trump about Huawei and ZTE sometimes being very harsh, sometimes signaling that there could be concessions to try to salvage his trade deal, that creates a lot of confusion among our allies. So they want to see uh, what happens uh, with the election and uh, uh, they're probably going to wait for that very important outcome before they uh, play out their hand on their longer term China approach. Great. We're uh, we're scheduled to stop in, in just a few minutes, but we've we've got a lot of great questions. So I want to uh, keep pushing the envelope on the time here. So uh, we understand some people may need to drop off at the scheduled time, but uh, I'm hoping to keep going a bit here. Uh, two areas that we haven't talked about really are uh, North Korea and Taiwan. Uh, do we see any changes under a Suga administration uh, in the approach to, to both those countries? On, on North Korea, Mr. Suga said he may be willing to meet with Kim Jong-un to try to solve the abductee issue, uh, but I haven't seen him make any comments really about the, the North Korea missile and, and nuclear threat, the, uh, whether they do an October surprise of some kind, either a launch or an uh, unveiling of a new strategic system. So. Uh, really, I'll throw that open really to, to anyone, Tobias or Jeff, you want to handle either of those? I, I think, um, so right before the, the presentation started, I, I caught about two minutes of Sugasan's press conference, and he, he answered a question from a reporter saying that the abductees is going to be a priority for him. Uh, again, how, if, if that's really a priority or if that's just lip service to the, to, to the media, I can't, nobody knows. Um, of course, the Japanese government's always going to say that re regaining the, pri the abductees is a priority, but realistically, whether that's possible, it's very difficult, as you, you Bruce, know very well. Um, all that's to say is that Suga-san is facing um, the same challenges with North Korea, and given all that Suga-san has done with the Abe administration um, and, and sort of the, the hardline approach that the Abe administration took vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, I would assume that we would see something similar from a, a Suga administration, but again, not knowing if in his press conference, if he gave comments at length about his what he wants for North Korea, it's difficult to actually say. Um, just quickly about Taiwan, uh, I think you see uh, the growing sort of camaraderie relationship between Japan and Taiwan. Um, you know, the big question always for for people who watch the Taiwan issue is, does little steps do you have what sort of symbolic steps do you have cabinet ministers visit do you have do you call uh, an organization or a, an official in taiwan by their official name like there's all those little things i think it'll be important to watch that as chinese aggression if if provocations and aggression grows against uh, japan or just generally in the east china sea does that bring taiwan and japan closer together uh, particularly uh, in the security sphere um, I think that's something to watch. I think that there's a lot of uh, forward-leaning politicians in the LDP on Taiwan. Uh, whether or not they actually can push a door open a little bit on the Taiwan issue is something that remains to be seen. Great, thank you. Um, it, I have a number of questions on Japan, South Korea, uh, and I know you, you covered some of that. Um, 
you know, the relations right now are, are quite poor. Uh, it's been a, a cyclical up and down over the decades. Uh, you know, things were not good during previous administrations, but it seemed under uh, the Abe administration, things got even worse. Uh, his uh, Many of his policies seen as very nationalistic or uh, not suitably apologetic for Japan's historic issues. Uh, with Abe gone, is that removing perhaps a, a very large irritant in the relationship and that uh, Suga and Moon Jae-in of South Korea can sort of move beyond it? Or do we think that Suga will either maintain Abe's policies uh, or continue to do things that would preclude improving relations? I'll throw that to open to anyone. It's, I mean, it's, it, as Jeffrey said, it's one of the big buckets on the foreign policy agenda. I, th I think in the near term though, it's really hard to see any real change because you now have, you know, you still have this question of, you know, when um, you know, South Korean district, district court is preparing to, you know, sell off assets that it that it seized from Nippon Steel, and I think it, you know, Suga as chief cabinet secretary uh, was out in front saying that we're prepared to retaliate on a number of fronts, um, you know, once, you know, if and when those assets are sold, and assuming that's going to go forward, and, and I haven't seen any sign to suggest that it's not. That's going to push things to to an even you know to even lower levels than we've already seen, and and in the near term, it's just it's hard to see um, how Japan changes course uh, on that front in the near term. Um, and, and you know, and I think the bigger issue too uh, domestically in Japan is that when you look at uh, public opinion, ever since you know, uh, Abe basically decided to up the stakes last year, taking South Korea off uh, the white list, exempting um, South Korean companies from fast track uh, the ability to import sensitive items quickly um, that Abe had a lot of support from the public I mean those those policies that response that hard line to South Korea was actually a lot it was, it was more popular than his government was um, which means that so even people who didn't particularly like him thought that that was the right approach and you look at other polls just about um, attitudes towards South Korea I mean there has been I mean I mean dare I say I mean I think there's been some decoupling um, in, at least in, in how the two countries view each other. I think you've seen Japanese companies reducing their investments in South Korea for a long time, even before uh, you know, these court cases came up. And I think it's certainly not gonna help if they have to worry um, you know, that their investments could end up getting seized if they lose a case like this. And so, I mean, the basis, I mean, you, there really is a, um, a sense, I think, in both governments that they don't necessarily view each other um, as sharing the same interest on, on key issues. And it's going to be hard. It's hard to see how Suga alone is going to be able to change that. I mean, I think you, having a fresh start, having a leader um, who didn't, may, who doesn't maybe have um, Abe's blind spots on, on South Korea. I mean, and, and I think we can say that we have seen that over the last couple of years. Maybe frees up um, Japan to be a little more creative and flexible. But I, I think you know, Suga would be running into some pretty strong headwinds. That there's just not a lot of support um, for leniency. Uh, in Japan towards the current South Korean administration. So it's hard to see without political change in South Korea as well, um, you know, for, for a, um, a, a, a detente, let's say, between Japan and South Korea. Right, it, yeah, it doesn't seem very encouraging, but it, it would take both sides trying to set aside some issues. But I think the the Supreme Court case, as well as uh, whether it's implemented, will really be the biggest factor, I think, in, in bilateral relations. Um, unfortunately, we, we, although we have a lot of great questions left, uh, we're, we are over time, uh, and I appreciate uh, our panelists going, uh, going into extra innings here to answer some of those, those questions. So uh, I'd like to thank our panelists or our Japanalists for sharing their insights uh, on a wide range of issues. And uh, so um, if you work on Hill at a think tank or just have questions, uh, please contact me using the information that's listed on the screen. I'd love to continue the conversation. And immediately following this event, you'll receive a survey that we hope you'll complete so that we can bring ideas that you care about to the, to the public square. So to see the events we have coming up, uh, check out heritage.org slash events. Again, thank you. Have a great day or a great evening if you're in Japan. And uh, we are now concluded.